who don't know me, I'm sure many, or if not most of you, have heard the other preacher guy speaking up here, Reverend Dr. David McLaurin. Um, surprise, I'm his daughter. Um, and yes, special shout out to my dad. Um, thank you for helping me prepare and um, happy Father's Day in advance. Um, so I recently had the privilege of graduating uh, from Ambrose University in Calgary, Alberta. I graduated with a BA in Christian Theology. And um, so I'm honored and I'm very excited to be able to share a word with you all today. Um, I'd like to share a word today on um, the Father heart of God and the privilege that we have to be called His children. Also, a special thanks to um, ETF for this wonderful opportunity here today. And I'd, I'd like to invite you all to please stand as I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this day, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together here today and to have fellowship and to celebrate our fathers. Um, Lord, we're reminded of the great privilege that we have of being your children. Father, may my words be pleasing to you and you give us all ears to hear and um, may these words be not mine, Lord, but yours. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I came across um, three Japanese proverbs. As we know, Japanese, um, in their culture, they have proverbs. And I found three that are about fathers. So the first one is, A father's goodness is as high as the mountain, and the mother's goodness is as deep as the ocean. Very deep. Yes. <laughs> I was expecting a ooh or ah. <laughs> <laughs> The second proverb is, if the father is a frog, the son will also be a frog. <laughs> Don't ask me what these frogs. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and the third and last one is, there are four most dreadful things on the planet Earth. The first are fires, earthquakes, thunderbolts, and fathers. <laughs> That's great. That's good. <laughs> um, as much as that's a lighthearted joke, um, I know some of us, if not most of us, um, we know that our fathers are not perfect. Um, but that's just the reality that we live in in this world. And we all know that because we all feel the effects of sin. Um, sin is anything that is rebellion against God. It distorts the truth. And while we can talk a lot about this, talk about our fathers and whatnot, um, in light of the upcoming Father's Day, I've chosen to remind us about what a blessing it is that we can call God our holy, perfect Father in Heaven. Um, so, so to illustrate the answer, I would like to start with actually, I would like all of us to have a question in mind. How do you recognize God as your Father? And are you living into the privilege of what it means to be His child? To illustrate the answers to these questions, we'll be looking at the Father heart of God and our identity as his children, and why this makes a difference in our lives today. Gospel writer John says, See what great love God has lavished on us, that we might be called the children of God. So my friends, it's no coincidence that Jesus tells his followers that they must be born again. So I know a lot of us have grown up in the Christian tradition, um, and we've heard a lot about God the Father. Um, the late J.I. Packer, he says, he is an, um, a well-known evangelical theologian, and he says, Father is the Christian name for God. Nonetheless, we sing songs about God the Father. Um, earlier we sang, I am a child of God. Shout out to the worship team for that beautiful worship Amen. as well. Thank you so much for that. And later on we'll hear how deep the Father's love. And for the history and the theology, the the theology nerds in the room, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, some of you might have heard of those, important Christian documents, they all begin with some variation of the line, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. So the Father, as we see, is part of our long Christian history. God is the archetype for fatherhood. He is the perfect role model for all the fathers in this room. So I hope you're all taking notes today. Um, but yeah, also another something that we probably um, were taught to memorize as a, as a 
as kids is the Lord's Prayer. It begins with the two words, Our Father. And finally, parables or stories. Probably one of the most well-known parables in the Bible is the one of the prodigal son in which the father demonstrates extreme love and grace towards his child. To be honest, as I was preparing for this sermon, uh, it was difficult to narrow down such a vast, such a big topic of who God the Father is. Um, but for the sake of time, I'd like to cover just three of his main attributes here in the first part. Um, the fact that God is a father who is compassionate, he is generous, and he is our maker. He is our creator, the Bible tells us. So what better place to look for these characteristics than in his word? In the New Testament, the father is often um, addressed to by Jesus. Um, the Gospel writers record Jesus as he spends time with his Father. He's in prayer with his Father. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, the Father. Um, but we also see in the Old Testament, the Father is also quite present. God was often seen as a father figure to the nation of Israel, who we know are the Hebrew people. Um, he affectionately and possessively called the Israel nation his firstborn. You can find that in the book of Exodus. But Psalm says King David also, in a very well-known psalm, Psalm 103, he recognizes God as Father in verses 8 to 14. Um, join me as I read. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed his transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, and he remembers that we are dust. The word of the Lord. Now this text alone can be a sermon all on its own about the father characteristics of God. Um, but for the sake of time, we see that God is compassionate. He is loving, he is merciful, and he is gracious towards his children. An example we see in the Old Testament, um, God speaks to prophet Jeremiah, and he says, when you call on me, and come to me and pray to me, I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Here we see that God listens to his children. He desires to be found by them, and he anticipates to be in relationship with his children. What a thought that God the Father would anticipate a relationship with us. The prophet Daniel as well, um, he also depends on these father characteristics when he powerfully prays in chapter 9. He says, We do not make requests of you, God, because we are righteous, but rather because of your great mercy. So friends, we have confidence to come to God because he is compassionate. And the Bible tells us that his mercies are new every morning. Moving on, we see that God is also a generous God. Paul reminds us of the of God's greatest act of generosity in Romans 8, verse 32. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Jesus, as we know, is God's greatest gift to the cosmos, to the world. Second, Jesus himself also talks about the generosity of the Father in giving us believers the gift and the person of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And we'll talk more about this later. But scripture is full of examples highlighting God the Father's generous heart towards his children. James, the brother of Jesus, also encourages believers to ask God who gives generously for wisdom in their time of need. Finally, above all these characteristics, we see that God is like, we see God's role and we see him 
as our creator and our maker. Now this understanding of knowing God as our maker is important because it is a way of knowing ourselves. I'll say that again. The understanding of who God is as our maker, as our creator is important because it is a way of knowing ourselves. It's a way of knowing who we are. For example, as Christians, when we know that we are deeply loved, when we know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible tells us, when we know that we are made in the image of God, our lives are very different than those who do not know that truth yet. The prophet Isaiah echoes this sentiment in a prayer of praise. In chapter 64, verse 8, he says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So then, if this is the Father heart of God, and he's chosen to make us in such a way, who are the children of God? How does one become a, ch a child of God? What does this mean? And why is this identity important? And the Bible is very clear on who is a child of God and who is not a child of God. John chapter 1, verse 12, Gospel writer writes, he's talking about the Logos, he's talking about the Word. And he says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So here we see the children of God is a title that is reserved only for those who have chosen to receive and believe in the name of Jesus and his work on the cross. Jesus himself testifies to this truth by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Paul provides a summary of this process, this whole adoption process, in Galatians chapter 4. He says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit that calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but you are God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. So there's a lot there, but it's all about entering into the family of God. So what is a child of God, you ask? Here we see that uh, the phrase adopted into sonship. Um, this is a legally binding term. In the context of the Roman Empire, when this text was written, um, and the term adoption to sonship was represented in one original Greek word called huiodesia. Huio, or huios, means son, and desia is derived from a word meaning to place, or to appoint, or to assign. So together, the legally binding term huiothesia means to place as a son. The Bible tells us through the person of Jesus Christ, we are placed into the royal family of God. If God is the king of kings, then we are all princes and princesses when we are entering into this family. God is not playing around with this terminology. As a believer, a child of God is not like a child, but rather is a legit member of his family. So in the heavenly courts, in God's jurisdiction, this is a truth that stands. As a child of God, we also go from being a sinner to being saved from the power of sin and death. Because the Bible says, whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. You become, you go from being an orphan to becoming a family member. Jesus says himself, I will not leave you as an orphan. So in this family of God, we have brothers and sisters. We, have, we are co-heirs with Christ. And we have an inheritance, finally. And this, this inheritance is eternal life in heaven with the Father. The Bible tells us that heaven is a place where there is no need for the sun or the moon to shine because the glory of God gives it light. So this inheritance is a wonderful promise. It's a, it's a privilege that we have as God's children. Peter says in his letter that this inheritance can never perish, it can never spoil, it can never fade because this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, child of God. What an eternal promise. But why is knowing this about our identity important? The late J.L. Packer 
a theologian that I mentioned earlier, he writes a book called Knowing God. And he says, very fascinating, he says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes at the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, then it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Now that's a bold statement. Um, it's definitely something I think is worth pondering upon to meditate on because for him, being a child of God is so radical that it demands our full attention. So I wonder, what are we captivated about in our identity as being a part of God's family? What is it that captivates our attention? But what does this mean for us? It means that we are transformed by having a relationship with our Father. It means that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have access to the Holy Spirit at all times. And it means, as the Bible says, we shine like stars. The knowledge of being a child of God empowers us to live a life of incredible belonging, incomparable joy, and one of confidence that only grows as we continue to journey with God and seek Him through His Word. Richard Foster has another book. I have another book quote, on the subject of prayer. Um, this is a book that I actually had to read last year for one of my classes, and I was quite fascinated and just awestruck by this concept. But he talks about petitionary prayer. He says that while petitionary prayer, or making petitions to God, presenting requests before God for oneself, it can be seen as a low form of prayer, compared to, for example, contemplative prayer, or meditative prayer, you know, the prayer that nuns and monks do, like, whoa, like that. Um, he says that petitionary prayer can be seen as a lower form. However, he says this should actually be a staple diet for a child of God. Why is that? Because it is a fundamental code of the parent-child relationship. Did you know that the Lord's Prayer is also mostly petitionary? <clears throat> the Father delights in hearing his child's requests. God the Father delights in granting those requests for his children. I referenced earlier a passage from Luke chapter 11. Um, if we humans who are evil know how to give good gifts to our Father, how much will our Father in heaven long to give us? And it's true, because we are self-centered, we all know that. How much more should we expect from a God who is holy, from a God who is generous? from a God who is compassionate, from a God who is merciful, and who loves us unconditionally above all. So expect God to be faithful. Depend on your Father, because it is our right as His children to ask Him for things. Next, we see another way that um, being a child of God makes a difference, is we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. As a child of God, we always have access to the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, Jesus calls this Holy Spirit the Advocate. In Greek, that's parakletos. That's, the, that's how we get the English word paraclete. This is another legal term. See, God is not playing around when it comes to inviting people. He wants people to come into his family. That's why he uses these legal terms, because they're the real deal. He's only interested in having us as his children. Now, this term also means uh, one who literally pleads for another before a judge. So he's like a lawyer. He's always... He has access, we always have access to this kind of help. The famous Billy Graham also said once, the Holy Spirit illuminates our minds. He makes us yearn for God, and he takes spiritual truth and makes it understandable to us. As a child of God, the Holy Spirit is your helper. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you. The Holy Spirit helps you to fine tune so you can hear the voice of your Father. He gives us gifts. He gives us insight and he teaches us among so many other things he does. But this is a privilege only for the children of God. And finally, as children of God, we shine like stars in the sky. I actually didn't even know this existed until I was doing the research. Like stars in the sky. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, 15, So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. That you will shine among them like the stars in the sky. 
One of my favorite artists, um, Phil Wickham. I know some of you may have known his um, songs. Um, Living Hope is one of them. Um, there is Amazing Grace. As I was um, just kind of preparing for this, and I had my worship playlist on, which kind of, I think this was last week, I was listening to a song and I realized it said Children of God. And so I was like, oh, this is great. I can use this in my sermon somehow. And so I did the research. And it turns out the whole album itself is called Ch Children of God. So I dug even further and I uh, found a video where um, Phil Wickham, he talks about how he was inspired to create this album. And it's a testimony that I feel is encouraging and I, I trust that God will use. So he says that in 2014, so he's a singer, he's a, he's a musician, he's an artist, um, that was calling in life, it still is. Um, and he shares how in 2014, he was unfortunately diagnosed with a disease on his vocal cords. Um, so he had to, the doctor told him he had to get surgery. And the doctor also told him that after the surgery, while he could still talk, he would be able to speak, um, but he would not be able to sing. And so obviously this really crushed Phil. He was like, wow, like, God, I thought this was my calling in life. I thought you had gifted me in such a way that I would use my voice to glorify you. Um, and so he describes how one day he's just sitting in his house and he is just crying out to God. He's pouring out his heart and he's, and he's just confused. He's bewildered. He's all of that. Um, but he describes how he felt the undeniable nearness of God. And God spoke to him. He spoke just a few words to him. And he said, Phil, I am your father, and you are my child. Just trust me. Just trust me. And so, that's how the album was born. And as he was looking into verses, the um, children of God being like shining like stars in the sky was what inspired him to make this album. Because we all know that we live in a dark world. Like, it's, it's not a surprise to us. We turn on the news, something that we don't like, somebody forwards something else on WhatsApp. We don't want, we, we don't hear it, or we don't want to hear it. But as children of God, we light up the darkness because of the power of God within us. Wherever you go, to your work, to your school, among your friends, among your family, you have the power and the light of God in you. And we are all on the same team when we're part of the same family. After spending the last five years on and off living in Calgary, I had become quite accustomed to seeing the red Calgary Flames logo. Calgary Flames hockey, do you have any hockey fans in here? <laughs> um, so Calgary Flames is the Calgary hockey team. And so I would see like the, like the logos all over the place. I remember at church even one time, the pastor wore a jersey to church. But you see like on the back of buses, I went to Superstore and they had like decorations everywhere. But nonetheless, I will never, I will never forget the time that I was riding on the sea train, I think I was going to the library to study or something, but I will, I will never forget the joy that I felt when I saw the one blue Vancouver Canucks jersey. <laughs> what can I say? Once a BC girl, always a BC girl. But in the same way, friends, there is joy in doing life with your family. There is joy in doing life with people who are on the same team as you. ETF, this is a great example of how there is joy in fellowship. Here we hear the word of God. We share a meal with our friends and our family. And, all, and, and honestly, leading up to um, the sermon today, I couldn't say how thankful I am for all the support that I received. But not only do we shine, but we also, the Bible tells us, that we have a purpose. The Word of God tells us, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. God is in the business of reconciliation, and He wants to use you. He believes that He can use every single one of us, doesn't matter how tall, how short, young or old, poor or wealthy, weak or strong, he has a purpose for your life. So be encouraged today that it is not a mistake that you are a child of God. And if you are not a child of God here in this room, as we heard earlier, all you have to do is to believe and receive the person and work of Jesus Christ. And if that's something that you want to do, um, perhaps that's something that God stirring in your heart, listen to your heart because that's what God speaks to us. The Bible tells us he knows our heart. So if that's something that is on your heart when there are people who are available to pray with you, to pray for you after the service. 
But he just, but God desires all of us to be part of his family. And he wants his children to be his dearly loved children. Allow me to close with an illustration. Um, one day, a father and a four-year-old boy, um, they were going to a park. The father decided to take his young boy to the park. The mom was out doing groceries, so dad was like, we'll fill time, we'll go to the park. So they get there, and as soon as they get there, the little boy, he sees a sandbox. And you see, his preschool didn't have a sandbox. So this playground was more of a playland for him. He was like, oh, this is something new. And so he goes to the, he goes to the sandbox, and the, and the father decides to just sit on the bench on the side and just watch his boy play. And this boy is mesmerized by the textures and the colors. And as soon as he puts his fingers in, he realizes that there's something else underneath the sand. So he digs, he digs, he digs, and he sees there's a big rock. And now he's like, okay, well, this is like completely an obstacle because I want my um, sandbox to be like without any fault. Um, so he tries to move this rock. He, he's like, I need to get this rock out of the sandbox. So, and he's, a, and he's like only four years old, so it's a, it's a fairly big rock, so he's trying to push. So he pushes and he pushes, finally he's able to get the rock to the edge of the sandbox. However, now, he has to get the sandbox out, or he, sorry, he has to get the rock out of the sandbox. And so this takes a little bit more strength, more than he had, had anticipated. And so he tries, he tries, he tries to push, Finally, he gives up, his arms are fried, he's exhausted, he's frustrated, and he just starts crying. The father sees this, and the boy just starts hysterically crying. He's sobbing, he's just frustrated. The father comes over and is consoling his son. He's um, comforting his son, who is dejected and disappointed. And the father says to the son, why did you use all the strength that was available to you to move the rock? The boy was confused. He said, I did, Dad, but it was just too heavy. The father replied, no, son, you didn't. You didn't ask me to help. And at that, the father lifted the rock and with a single hand tossed it outside of the sandbox. So I ask you, are you a child of God with no need of your father? Perhaps are we too self-sufficient? Or perhaps is your pride making you ignorant to the heart, to the father heart of God? Have we forgotten our initial childlike faith? See, in the story, the father was there and ready to help the whole time, but the boy didn't see it. So my encouragement to all of us tonight is allow God to take care of you. He is your father and you are his child. He is not a dreadful father. Rather, we've seen he's compassionate, he is loving, he is gracious, and he's a generous God. And above all, he is your maker. As children of God, we can depend on him. That's the good news. He empowers us with his Holy Spirit and wants to use us to light up this dark world. What more do we need? What more do we need than this knowledge? So take stock, reflect, reevaluate. How well do you recognize God as your father? And are you living into the privilege of being his child? Stand with me as I close in prayer. For your presence here today with us, thank you, Lord, for speaking to us with a much-needed reminder of who you are, Father, and how we can depend on you no matter what. Thank you for adopting us into your family. Father, for that, we are ever grateful. May you continue to draw our hearts and minds to you. Father, would you give us the desire to seek you every day and strengthen us as we depend on your Holy Spirit. Father, would you reveal yourself to us in a special way this week, and would you bless all the fathers in the room today. Thank you for the example that they are, Lord, and would you continue to guide them as we all learn what it means to be your child. Help us to live in the privilege of being your dearly loved children. God, would you give us more faith. In your most precious, powerful name, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.